Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. For some aspects of gaming and research. I'm very pleased to announce Corey Andreka from Second Life. Um, Corey is a VP of Development. Second Life is an unusual online world where it has a vast real world economy and it has a large user base, but all the content created is property of the users. It um, doesn't have the traditional aspects of a multi massively multiplayer. There aren't huge battles and things, but it does have a huge community aspect. And so it's been getting huge amounts of press and a great deal of um, positive uh, reputation. So without further delay, let me introduce Corey Andreka from Second Life. Cool. Thank you, John. So we're going to cover a lot of ground uh, today. So if you have questions, um, rather than waiting till the end, although I'm happy to take questions at the end, please just interrupt, wave your hand, throw something at me. Um, get my attention so we can stop and answer as we get going, especially if we're covering something that you know you don't understand because that's going to make the less of the talk less less interesting. So we're going to do a brief history of where these games come from. By these games, I mean sort of massively multiplayer online games, uh, the most popular of which today is the Morpig or the massively multiplayer online role-playing game. That neatly segues into a very common topic within the game community today, which is that spiraling and escalating development costs are going to lead to the death of games. And so there are many very bright people sort of running around with their hair on fire saying we're doomed. Um, and we're going to talk about why Second Life may play into one of the solutions to that. We're going to then talk about sort of where Second Life is going from, from here. Um, and although this slide says five, there are actually six things because there is something else I noticed this morning that are areas of research that hopefully bright people like yourselves are going to start working on. So, when I talk about digital worlds, and these places have a lot of names. You'll hear digital worlds, virtual worlds, online worlds. Everybody sort of has been picking their own. Ted Castronova has adopted synthetic world, um, so maybe that's going to win. But we talk about consistency and persistence being the really critical aspects. Consistency meaning that when you're in them, so you have some predictive power, or some predictive ability to know that what you do is going to have consequences and results. Persistence that when you do those interesting things, that when you come back a week later, they had some impact on the world. And those, those impacts stayed around for a while. And also that a lot of people are interacting in these spaces. So this is distinct from, say, a first person shooter, which has an online component. You may have 64 people running around in an instant space. But when the game is over, that space goes away, and then you create a new one. And also 64 is not, is not many. Well, interesting, it's, it's not a lot. So where did these things come from? sort of pull from three relatively disparate technologies, um, the internet, the early online gaming, and then avatar-based games. Um, and so you guys all know the, this wonderful thing we have started really small. I love this, this paper drawing because the, the excitement of having these you know, three, four nodes, right? And yet, yet this was, this was going to turn into Wikipedia, right? And now, the importance of Wikipedia is more than just the fact that, okay, we have this net and there are these cool web pages on it, right? This is distributed creation by many, many, many people. And this is really powerful and this is very transformative. Now, certainly Wikipedia has lots of questions, like what are the quality implications of having people all over the world? Right? We just heard that maybe accidentally the BBC was using Wikipedia to advertise an alternate reality game, right? They were posting, well, again, they, 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 their position is it was an over-enthusiastic fan, and then it was an employee who happened to not have permission. Anyway, independent of that, right, here you have somebody exploiting Wikipedia to do advertising. And that certainly has consequences because up till now, the attacks against Wikipedia have either been based on ignorance or sort of the typical <coughs> online flame, flame wars writ large because now you have a bigger place to do it. But very, very powerful stuff. So as soon as computers were connected, people started playing games on them. Um, one of the most important was created by these two dapper British gents, um, Richard Bartle and Roy Trubshaw, who made MUD. Now referred to, of course, as MUD 1, because then there was a MUD 2, and et cetera, et cetera. But MUD was multi-user dungeon, probably. Nobody seems to agree on exactly whether it meant anything or not, and they keep changing their stories. So, 
but let's just assume that it, it meant something. And the idea was, well, let's guess 1980 geeks, they played Dungeons and Dragons. Now computers were connected, so let's play Dungeons and Dragons connected on our computer. And now what's really important about this is that nearly all of the elements, when you start looking at the more pig or the massively multiplayer online role playing game, can be traced back to decisions that Richard and Roy made. Right? They said, gosh, Dungeons and Dragons have levels. We should have levels. Levels will be the, the metric of, of completion, of how we progress through this world. And we'll see that that has pretty profound implications because when you, when you get to more pigs. Now, separate from the sort of mud line, you had Randy and, Tripp, or, and Chip who said, well, we're going to create this avatar-based world. And it's going to be different. It's not going to be sort of Dungeons and Dragons. It's going to be more like a proxy for the real world. And this was running on, a, on, on Commodores in the early 80s. And of note, this is the only commercially successful online avatar world ever. And, uh, and they did, it was very, very popular for a time. And again, when you start looking at what we see in these online spaces, so people trying to cheat, people forming communities, people forming communities to cheat people, right? All of those behaviors were done in Lucasfilm's Habitat, which is what the screenshot is. So these sort of came together in the late 90s in the Morpig. The first one is in the upper left-hand corner, um, which is Meridian 59. And this was this big leap forward. You had graphics. You had all the sort of Dungeons and Dragons elements. You had scantily clad elves. I mean, you had everything that's become kind of the standard for this space, for, for better or for worse. And then very rapidly, you had Ultima Online in the lower left. And then you had sort of the big, the first 800-pound gorilla in the space, which is EverQuest on the right. EverQuest you know, came in, really expanded the market, started appealing to a much broader set of users and was on top for a long time. Now, it's since been supplanted. The upper left is Star Wars Galaxies, which is in many ways considered a failure for only having 200,000, 250,000, whatever their number is, users, 400,000. The number changes all the time. But in the lower right hand is World of Warcraft. And if you know anything about this space, you've heard about World of Warcraft. Blizzard, being a company known for making single player games, spent a very large amount of money and a lot of time to enter the online game space very aggressively. And since then, they now have variously reported 3.5 million customers, 4 million customers. They launched in China and you know, within 8 seconds had 1.5 million customers. You know, what, whatever, whatever the numbers were, the numbers are large. Right? They have a million plus customers in Europe, which is five times what any of these games had ever done before. And nobody's quite sure whether those customers came from. Now, and of course, we got a curve that looks like this. And let's face it, if you're going to have growth, you want your curve to look like that. Um, and this doesn't include a bunch of really big recent games. So the, the worldwide subscriber number is somewhere around 10 million, 12 million people, which is starting to seem if not completely insignificant. Now, the problem, of course, is nobody knows how many of those customers are actually people. Um, as you guys are probably painfully aware, online identity is not a solved problem. You know, companies use the proxy of credit cards for identity, which, you know, doesn't work. Nor do the credit card companies really want to be in that position. But whether it's customers, whether it's people, we are seeing dramatic growth in that space. And we're also seeing growth along with that in economic uses of these worlds. Um, these users, or these worlds create very large secondary markets. So for example, in Star Wars Galaxies, uh, your goal is to become, appropriately enough, a Jedi. Right? So you spend a lot of time, and by a lot of time, I mean hundreds of hours, potentially, grinding away, gaining experience. And so you gain experience by doing things like you know, killing monsters, or in Star Wars Galaxies, you know, dancing in a club, or healing people. And you're going to do these very time-intensive activities that eventually will get you far enough along that you can become a Jedi. Well, that Jedi is worth around 1,000 US dollars if you go to eBay with it, right? And all the games have these kinds of value for time trade-offs where certain people who have lots of time, particularly students, are going to earn a lot of experience, a lot of value in these games. And then other people are going to come along and say, well, I don't want to spend all that time or I can't spend all of that time. And so they're going to go to eBay and engage in a tra transaction. Now, the party line is that this is a no-no. In fact, most online games have in their terms of service or in their end-user licensing agreement very clear call-outs. They have things like 
you may not make money in any way off of this game. You may not you know, buy or sell this stuff. And they've tended to invo invoke copyright and lots of other things, which will eventually end up in court, because nobody really knows what's going what's, what's to happen with this stuff. Now, interestingly, Sony just reversed this position, and EverQuest 2 now has a Sony-sponsored trading system where you can go and exchange US dollars for in-game assets. Why would these guys block in the economy? Is it going to be a good thing for them to build on the market? Well, which answer do you want? So there, there are sort of the, there are the, there's a host of official answers. The, the first one um, championed by, so Ted Castronova sort of the guru of economics in these spaces, and he's a big advocate of real-world transactions break games, that it's not fun. And the example always used is, you and I are playing Monopoly, and I bribe the banker with a 20 to, to get something, right? And then you say, oh gosh, that's cheating. We come to fisticuffs, and it's bad. And that destroys games. Now, there are some issues with the Monopoly example. It's glib. It's cute. It doesn't really necessarily fit the evidence. The other thing is, the evidence seems to be that on the order of 60% of players of these games, are engaging in real-world transactions. So the argument that most players don't want it may not be true. The second argument is that it increases customer service load. That if you're going to eBay and you agree to this transaction and you pay the guy with PayPal, um, there's a very common fraud behavior, which is you have virtual stuff. I have PayPal. You give me the virtual stuff. I give you PayPal. I then tell PayPal, I never got it. Reverse the charge. You're now out your virtual stuff. You don't get the US dollars. PayPal's position is that if there's no tangible delivery, you can reverse the charge because that's what the credit cards use as their rule. Thus, there's this massive opportunity for fraud in the space, which, as you are all figuring out, right, if you don't have identity, it's very hard to react to the fraud because you can't permanently ban people. Yeah? But, uh, for example, in that Star Wars example, is that true that uh, when you're gaining this uh, virtual experience, you're also gaining some actual experience as a player. Then, then when you uh, run into another today, you, you expect him to have been player, playing for hours. And it's not right, so, so the third reason, continuing down the list. But Sorry. That, no, no, that's great. Right. So the third reason is that you get um, asymmetries of skill. So you get somebody who just bought their way to the top, and they come in, and that's reducing the, the fun. Um, and I'm sure there are 10 others that we could come up with. Um, the flip sides are sort of equally obvious, right? It's a market. And this is, in fact, a, Sony, a relatively senior Sony person at Edinburgh Game Festival came out and said, it's too big a market. We'd be stupid to not take a piece of it, which then got spun radically away from that very quickly by other Sony employees. But um, so there is the obvious one, right? It's a big market. And you can take a piece of it. Why wouldn't you? Um, when we get to talking about Second Life, there are a bunch of reasons why this is very good for us. The, the, the fourth bad reason, though, is that it commoditizes the content of the game. And the problem is you have this game that needs to keep a user's attention for 2,000 hours. Well, the way you keep their attention for 2,000 hours is first you kill spiders, then you kill rats, then you kill small inoffensive dogs, and eventually you get to a dragon, right? Well, if you can just buy your way to the dragon, you've skipped. $50 million worth of art development. <laughs> and the only way these games stay up is they have live teams cranking out new artwork. And if that new artwork's being commoditized, that's a problem. We'll get to that. So anyway, so the estimates are about a billion dollar worldwide market. Um, and its, its curve looks exactly like the growth in customers. Um, the other thing that's important is much like if we were measuring US trade with the, re with the rest of the world, GDP is much larger than that. And the estimates tend to run 10 to 20 times trade as the internal GDPs of these economies. So now you're talking $20 billion, which, you know, that's not tremendous money, but it's enough to seem real. I mean, it's larger than, say, bottled water sales in the US, so that's, that's real. Um, so, of course, the problem is these aren't the only curves that are showing exponential growth. You know, the, the first one, um, obviously, is we're getting more and more horsepower in all of our computers, and that's good, right? We all like that. Everybody's happy, which means, well, we better make more content. Right? So when you look at the content that gets shipped in these games, you'll see a curve that basically tracks Moore's Law. Now, we actually seem to be getting a little bit better at making content over time, but not enough to fix, well, this problem. These are game budgets over time. 
Um, and again, you know, Blizzard isn't talking about what World of Warcraft cost, but when you hear the rumors and talk to friends and everything else, you hear numbers that sound like movie budgets and not B movie budgets either. So this is really expensive. And people start to get a little nervous when games start costing this much. And of course, because software development, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, is one of the most efficient engineering endeavors out there, um, we have this problem, right? That these games are taking longer and longer to make. You run into Mythical Man Month, you run into all the things that you would imagine. And unlike you fine folks, the game industry is not renowned for being a bastion of efficient software development, right? The, the game industry is renowned for crunch time and everything else. Now, this would be all, all okay, except now we're going to get a curve that isn't doing exponential growth. Right, and this is where we get into the, oh my goodness, games are doomed. This is really bad, because the market isn't growing fast enough. And some very bright people in the game industry have actually gone on the record and said things like this. Gordon Walton, who until recently was a VP at Sony Online, um, has done, been in game, these online worlds since pretty much their inception, said this in an interview, and it's, it's, it's pretty staggering when you stop and think about it, that if the costs are rising faster than your market's growing, that's bad. Um, and so, wow, I seem to have screwed up my next slide. Sweet. I'm going to skip the next slide and get to this one, because you have a bunch of people who go around saying that we're doomed. And the story basically goes like this. So this is the small developer, right? right? And then we have the publisher, right? And that this is what the game industry is like right now. And that maybe there's some solutions out there, like procedural or adaptive solutions. So that's Will Wright. So you guys have all played Sims, Sims 2, SimCity. You know, Will's brilliant. And Will's saying, well, the way to attack this is to make the game adapt to the player. And so there's a game that was recently announced called Spore. Um, it's been getting a lot of very good coverage. That's the idea being that as you play the game, you end up generating a unique experience. Now, the fine print on sport development is that it still has a really large team and it's still taking a really long time to make. So the adaptive side, we haven't really hit out of the park yet. Again, you guys all know, right, doing AI well, doing, you know, interesting behaviors is very hard. And so when it gets hard, you fall back and hire better artists and have them do it. Um, and then so Raf Koster, who is the lead designer on Star Wars Galaxies, he's a um, chief creative officer at Sony Online Entertainment. Um, and unfortunately, the, the, the URL was so messy that I didn't want to put it on a slide. But if you search Raf Koster and Moore's Wall, you'll find a link to it. Uh, and he basically focused just on the cost of production as being a problem for games. And so his argument was, well, maybe we look at you know, procedural generation of like, you know, worlds and buildings and things like that, which again, probably a good idea. Now, there is another option, which is you go toward user creation. But then you run into a bunch of user creation FUD, which of course is that creation's hard, right? That we have casual players, there's no way you're gonna get them to come out and actually make anything that's anything good. And of course, you then get into the designer arrogance problem, which is, well, we need these game designers and they're the ones who are gonna actually make games and they're the anointed ones. And the rest of the talk, we're gonna be looking at Second Life and every screenshot you're gonna see in here is user created content within Second Life. So. We'll leave, leave the judgment of that, that to you guys. And user creation in Second Life is a little bit different, in fact, very different, than user creation in other worlds. And we're going to go into the reasons for this. But the important pieces to keep in mind is what happens when you have user creation happening inside an, an, an economy. Now, the first thing in Second Life, yes? Just a really quick question. I, I didn't quite catch. Is, is the art really like the Yeah, about 60% of, of, of development and increasing is, art, is content creation. OK, but the non-art portion is, is not growing exponentially. It's pretty fixed. Yeah, that used to be most, so. OK. Right, because there, there are ways to attack engine costs. You can go license middleware. You can, say, have great SDKs that get made that you can use to more easily port between different products. Um, and there's intense competition in the engine market, right? especially if you're making a standard game. Right? So if you're making a first-person shooter, you have, well, at least three very good engines to choose from. Uh, if you're making any of the really conventional games, so sort of you know, driving, platformers, again, there are conventional engines out there you can go and buy. But once you have the engine, you still don't have any of your art content. Mm -hmm. Now, if you buy a bad engine, you're still going to have a lot of technical development costs in building your toolchain. 
Um, but if you buy a really good engine, say like the Unreal Engine or even Doom 3 now has a really good tool chain that comes with it, you're now getting all of that out of the box. Y yes, you're still going to have to beat on it to do what you want it to do because they built it to do their games, but you're not building an engine from scratch. Mm -hmm. okay. Content costs, on the other hand, nobody's really attacked. So things that make Second Life different. First of all, Second Life, we talk about atomistic construction. You're building everything out of very small pieces, every one of which you can apply, everything that can be physically modeled because we run the whole world inside Havoc, so we've got rigid biodynamics going. We have a scripting language attached to everything. So anything you build in Second Life can be, it can be really complicated, and you can get things that, that we as the creators of Second Life would have never intended. So the, the upper right, two of, our, two of our users decided that clearly as a world, which Second Life is, um, is far more interesting if you have alien abductions, as, as we all know. And so they went out and said, well, we're going to make these avatars that are scary. And they made their crazy alien probe devices, and they built this UFO, and they'd fly around. And every now and then, this beam of light would come down, an avatar would be grabbed, get sucked up into their UFO. And then they'd kind of stand around menacingly with your, and then they'd give you a t-shirt that I was abducted by aliens and anally probed, and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. And of course, they were really clever because they only did it once every few weeks to start with. And so there was this rumor of alien abductions happening. And people would go into the forums, I was abducted. And people would say, no, no, you're just stressed. And, you know, and so, and this is the kind of thing you can get when you're just putting the tools in the hands of the users. And, and again, think, think the web, right? There's no way you could have figured out or guessed everything that's going to happen on the web. Now, is everything going to be good? No. Is everything going to be massively profitable? No. I mean, they eventually got bored of doing this and went on to other things. Now, profitable would be the gun. Um, so this is the Saburo Compact Exploder, who's actually made by a grad student who's up in, in this area. Um, and, you know, it's not paying for his tuition yet, but they sell for four, yeah, four U.S. dollars each, equivalent. Um, he sells enough of them to cover his beer and books, which as a grad student can be significant. Um, and, you know, widely regarded as, you know, for, for a long time as the best weapon inside Second Life. And the, one of the reasons, one of the things that he did to really stay on top is he was very clever about when, you, when he'd make improvements to the gun via the scripting language that's built into the system, next time you logged in, it would be waiting for you with a new version and an upgrade, and he'd do all that for free. And so, you know, his users all really loved him. Now, this is different from sort of conventional crafting. Crafting is what gets talked about a lot in online games. And so this is Ultima Online, just to explain some of the difference, right? So in Ultima Online, some users wanted a piano. And so they went and they figured out that if you sort of stack, this is a pile of shirts, and that's a checkerboard, <laughs> right? And, and then this is a cloak. And if you stacked all of this stuff, you got something that looks sort of like a piano. Now, this is, this is great, right? I mean, this is, these are users really going above and beyond, um, but it's really not a piano, right? So this is a piano in Second Life. Yeah. Yeah, quick question. So um, the, of the $2 million of transactions you've got going on a month in Second Life, is all of that... I haven't even gotten to that part yet. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sorry. I, you were listening before the talk started. Anyway, please. I read your thing. Uh, is that all virtual content? Is that all? Yeah. Okay. We'll get to that. Okay. Um, so anyway, so this is a piano that a, a user whose in-world name is QB Terra made, right? And as you, you might not be able to see, but each of the keys are individual objects. Each of the keys actually plays real notes. So you could compose on this if you wanted to. You could play. And remember, all of this is taking place in a shared space where you can have 10 people standing around with you saying, no, no, try playing it this way. So this is a very powerful form of creation that's very different than the kind of here are a bunch of pre-made things that we hand the users, and then maybe they can stack them to make something else. This is putting the raw materials in the hands of the users. So how do we do that? Well, we're streaming everything down. We need about 200 kilobits downstream, which four and a half years ago when we got started seemed like maybe would be a risky bet. That's turned out to be fine. Um, broadband adoption has been great. And what's interesting about it is that when you look at the overall world, and this is sort of Second Life today. Well, this is Second Life a, a month ago. Um, you have that level of creation happening all over the world, and you get these interesting collisions. So for example, on the previous slide, um, several users were competing to build the best skateboard. And so once they finally had a good one, they went around sort of doing world grinding, right? They just went looking for places to ride skateboards in Second Life, just like you would 
in the real world, right? You're not constrained by just saying, oh, well, here's the skateboard and it works in a skate park. This also brings us to the brief sort of technology digression. So Second Life runs on a distributed grid um, that we host. This is about 1,200 CPUs today. We grow that as our customer base grows. Each CPU runs about a 16-acre piece of the land, so a quarter kilometer on the side. Um, in that, you can have about up to 15,000 objects, physically simulated, rigid body dynamics, scripts running on it, um, 50 or 60 avatars. And they're all edge connected, so you can move seamlessly through this space. So this isn't an instanced or sharded world, for those who aren't familiar with those terms. How most games do this is you build a copy of your content and then you duplicate it. That way, as you have more customers come in, you don't have to build new content, because remember that content development is the big cost. Instead, you say, OK, well, you get to be in parallel universe A, and you can be in parallel universe B. The downside being that if you're in one and your friend's in the other, you know, never the twain shall meet. So Second Life, instead, the entire world is one, one contiguous space. Now, users can control, so for example, this constellation of islands out here, a lot of these customers decide that only they and their friends can see their space. Right, so they have basically access control permissions. But if you're connected to the mainland, everything can see you. And um, it's a pity we're a month out of date because there's actually now a big continent that's grown here that's one of our real estate speculators who's been buying up huge quantities of land and, and then reselling it. But we'll, we'll get to her. Do you, do you ever get situations where people, like traffic jams, everyone wants to converge on a single? No, we absolutely do. And that's certainly one of the, one of the technical problems because there are a couple ways to... <laughs> to do this, right? One way you can say is, okay, we're going to align CPU resources with land, and even when there's nobody there, we're going to let it keep running because, well, you may have scripts running there, you may have interesting things going on. Or you could do sort of the adaptive model where you're like, okay, well, there's nobody there, so now have one machine running this huge piece of land slowly. Um, because that's actually really easy to do if the, if the content isn't dynamic. It gets much harder to do when all the content's changing. So we decided to not try to solve that problem. So we do get traffic jams, and you can barely see it, but the, the green dots here are actually people. Um, and so what you get is the green, the green dots clump, as you would expect, right? They're the, if you go and look at the map, oh, they're green dots. I wonder why they're there. So I'll go join the green dots. But you do get feedback, right? You go there, and then the performance is degrading. So then you go somewhere else. Um, and because you can teleport, you can bypass any traffic jam. So you may not be able to go to the really fun thing that's happening right now. But if it's really fun, it's going to happen again tomorrow, um, probably. But no, that is a problem and one that we are often thinking about. Where is the mouse? There we go. Um, and so again, everything you've seen in here, everything you saw built, is built in world. It's not built in 3D Studio Max and imported embedded in Second Life for a set of building tools that let you build all these things. And it's happening server side. So that if I was building a car, you would all see the car being created in front of you and you could participate in that building. Yes? So that would prevent someone like, say, the person who designs the piano from designing it once and then stamping out 10 million of them and just, you know. No, he can't. We'll, we'll talk about that. He can't. Okay. But that's his choice. He can decide whether that piano is unique or not or whether people can take free copies of it or whether people have to pay him to get copies of it. Right, but he can just scan the copy. He doesn't have to move his guy and create it again. Okay. No, that's exactly right. Because, and we'll, we'll get to this, but you know, the, the beauty of staying in bits and not having to go to atoms is that you can avoid all of the problems of atoms. <coughs> right? why, why force a marginal cost of reproduction when none exists? Yeah, I'm just wondering what that does to the economics of things if you can, if you can stamp out a copy for free. Well, it means you don't, you don't have to. It becomes like intellectual property, I guess. Yes, in fact, we will get to that. In fact, unfortunately, it's all intellectual property. Yeah. Everything, that, and everything that happens in these spaces, even things that in the real world wouldn't be IP, all become IP. Right. Because everything's fixed. Every chat conversation you have, every, every dance you do, right? all of those are immediately fixed. So it's all intellectual property. <coughs> and we'll, we'll get to it. But one of the big differences in Second Life is the users retain their IP rights to things they make. So every other game has, we were talking about big clauses, like one of them saying you can't make money. Well, the other big one is you grant us all rights to everything and your firstborn child. Um, and we don't do that, and we don't do it for economic reasons. And we'll, we'll get to that. But if you're asking people to build a world, it's kind of stupid to say, hey, build a world, but you don't own it. 
So one of the other things that's different about Second Life is our demographics don't look like most of these games. Now, online games tend to skew a little bit more gender neutral than gaming in general. But by a little bit more gender neutral, it means, you know, 15 and 16 percent women as opposed to, you know, zero. But yes, okay, the study came out saying that more women than men play games because they looked at Yahoo games and, and casual games, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But among people playing games that require you to have a high-end PC, accelerated 3D, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, unfortunately, that continues to skew both young and male. Now, what we see in Second Life is a much more balanced um, uh, gender ratio than most games. The other thing that we see is we see uniformly higher adoption among as you get older than among the 18 year olds. <clears throat> and there are a host of sociological guesses as to why that may be the case and I'm sure eventually there will be a lot of studies on it. Um, but from our standpoint that's great because people who come in who are a little bit older bring a lot more skills into the world. And it turns out that your real world skills are very indicative of what you're going to be able to do in these games. So to, Going back to the question, did, can I get to you in one sec? Um, going back to, does commoditization break a game? So in like World of Warcraft, you know, you've, you've bought the sword. Yes, you may be a little bit better at hacking and slashing with the sword, but at the end of the day, you've mostly been investing time. You know, in fact, these games are very rarely described as skill-based. And in fact, online games are usually specifically designed to not be skill-based because there's a perception that people won't pay a recurring fee for something where another user's skill will defeat them. And what we've seen is that as long as you give people a very broad palette, they'll, they'll apply their skills where they can. Yes? How do you know what the gender breakdown is? Where, we don't. Where are you? Okay. We go to their house and we knock them. No. Uh, we don't. We, but we do survey them independently <coughs> in the sign-up process. And so, now, we've also met a lot of our key users. And to date, we've seen pretty high correlation between what they've told us. Now, will that change over time? Probably. Um, but I can only, this is this, this is self-reported. Um, now, looking at data from other games, they see a much lower self-reported percentage than we're seeing. So, for what that's worth. So the next thing you get, because all this is taking place simultaneously, is a great deal of amateur to amateur education collaboration. So, amateur to amateur meaning you don't have to be a professional, you know, 3D world creator to teach somebody how to use our building tools. And in fact, one of the most popular activities in Second Life, especially early on, was to hold classes to teach new users. Because, well, it lets you meet the new people. Um, new people are a resource. They come in and they have money. Um, and if you are sort of a social person, it works out well because it gives you a chance to sort of interact and be gregarious and all these other things. Now, what we've started to see is people using Second Life to bring in real world events. So this is a, a group, um, the Study for Accelerating Change, I think is their current name. They keep changing it. They run the Accelerating Change Conference, and they're a group of futurists. They like talking about interesting things, and they're a really good crowd. Well, they start holding these sort of future salon meetings in Second Life. And amusingly, they did one with a company called Kuma Reality Games, who makes online games, who then gave a presentation on their online game in Second Life to people all over the world. And this is kind of interesting. And what's cool is they don't have to ask our permission to do that. Right? They're just doing this as users of the product playing in the space and using it. And again, you have people sitting down. And this is where you start getting into what makes 3D interesting for communication because you know who's giving the lecture and who's listening, right? just like we do. Right? Getting this experience from text chat can be a lot harder. So. Donald's can go and put an ad up, up there in Second Life? So we have a carve out right now for real world advertising that we're currently internally debating getting rid of. Um, McDonald's could do that today. Okay. Now, there's a separate question of how effective it would be for McDonald's to do that. The, the whole concept of advertising in these games, we have 42,000 customers. I'm very happy about that number. We're growing 8 to 10% a month. That's great. When you talk about impressions to McDonald's, 40,000 impressions is, you know, they sneeze and get 40,000 impressions. Um, so I don't think that from a value perspective, it makes a lot of sense to them. Also, what we've seen in these spaces is that companies that come in and, and don't respect the spaces they're moving into tend to get um, negative feedback from the current player base would be the politest way to put it. 
Uh, we can go into more details of what I think they would do, but you know, the reality is I think real world companies can come into a place like Second Life, but they have to do so in a way that's respectful for the community and leverages the community, which is one of the points, right? <coughs> We've got thousands of people building stuff all the time. They love having purpose. So if you come in and say, build this thing, they go nuts. They will compete aggressively with each other for the honor of building stuff, right? And that gives you a way to, to go out there and, and, and leverage all these people. We'll talk about that. So Second Life isn't a subscription model. Traditionally, online, uh, the, the MMORPGs are a, you buy the box, and then you pay somewhere between $8 and $15 a month, in, you know, forever. Remember that slide with all of the 1,200 CPUs? The proxy for getting CPU time is land. And so if you want to have permanence in the world, so if you want to build your own city, and then maybe you know, lease out to tenants or whatever, you have to buy land from us. And so that has a recurring payment associated with it. On the other hand, if you just want to use Second Life casually, or maybe you want to go play World of Warcraft for a month or two, you don't have to pay us anything. And so what that allows is casual users to come in experience the product, use it for a while, come and go. And we see a lot of that where we'll see migration out to, say, when World of Warcraft launched. And then a month later, they start coming back in and building shrines to World of Warcraft and talking about World of Warcraft and, you know, everything else like that. So, and I apologize for not having newer numbers, but so in April, we had 20,000 people come through Second Life. Um, 50,000 different things were bought and sold in about a million player-to-player -player transactions. And the value then was about $2 million U.S. And so the, the numbers per person are pretty good. And remember, all of those things were b made by the users, and they're all made in-world. Yes? Are you starting to have, like, that shirt that Avatar is wearing is yep. somewhat similar to some that I've seen for real. Mm -hmm. So are you starting to have, like, copyright infringement issues where people are, like, making a digital shirt copy of a real shirt and selling it, and maybe their real company is looking... So much like a website, we are a DMCA safe haven. If you see something in Second Life that is in, infringing, well, this is copyright, not trademark. If you see a, a copyright infringement, you can send us a takedown notice. We will take it down. We then inform the user that it's been taken down. They can file a, a counter takedown, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just like we were a hosting provider. The world has, let's see, we're at eight terabytes of user-created data at this point, um, most of it visual. So, Attempting to, by inspection, determine whether something is infringing is not possible. So as much as I feel, would, you know, as from a technical standpoint, feel that DMCA is a reprehensible piece of legislation, the safe haven provisions are very important, much like they are to any hosting company, right? It's a little bit like asking, so is there any infringement on the web? So, which there is, right? But the question is, in, in what copyright law is supposed to be doing, is, is that infringement economically damaging or in other ways hurting the person who you've granted this temporary monopoly to? And so, again, if you're being hurt financially, you're going to give us a takedown notice. So, in fact, when we said we'd grant users uh, rights to their stuff, the assertion from a lot of the legal folks was that, oh, my God, this is going to turn into legal land. You're going to have takedown notices constantly. And in, um, so we've been up uh, a little over two years, and we've had two takedown notices come in yeah, two. And then one had a counter takedown happen, and then it was dropped, and then the one piece of content got removed. So we really haven't seen that yet, despite the fact that we do have a lot of economic activity going on. So where did those 50,000 things come from? So we have about 40,000 user hours a day. And you guys can read faster than I can, but about 30% of their time spent making stuff. So work out the math. It's a 2,200-person content development team who's paying me to use Second Life. Now, is all of it great? No. But a lot of it's great, I'll get you in a sec. Um, a lot of it's great for the people who are making it. And a lot of it is great for other people. And when you think about those 2,200 people, if I had to pay them, that's $220 million a year. And we keep scaling as we grow. Yes? Uh, you mentioned the cost of real estate. Yep. Uh, are there any other costs to do with resources? So, I mean, do you have to buy the wood for your piano? So you can just... You are buying... Land is a proxy for CPU. The CPU gives you... Apart from that, there are no limits on content creation. There are, so the amount, yeah, so the amount of land you own is how much, how much stuff you can have in one area permanently. And of course, there are limits, right? There's a CPU. You can abuse the CPU. 
Similarly, and I'll get to you in a sec. Um, similarly, on the, the client side, and we'll get to rendering. Um, rendering this world is very difficult. We are doing, if you, if you sat down with a blank sheet of paper and said, given present day GPU design, which is basically built to accelerate first person shooters, what is everything that you would do wrong? That would be Second Life. But we'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah. So does Second Life, can I rent or buy or both? And what's like your cost per acre or hectare or whatever? So if you're buying from us, yeah. which is sort of an initial, uh, an initial buy and then you own the land. So like a full simulator, which is 16 acres, is $1,000 up front and $200 a month. And then it goes down from there. There are also a lot of. Oh, the $200 a month goes down from there? No, 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 no. It goes oh. down as you buy less. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. But I'm always paying a monthly fee. That's right. Okay. Now, there are also users who, who are in the business of renting where you would never have to pay US dollars to. You pay only with internal currency. Right, so the internal currency is the Linden dollar. It's currently trading at, I think, $3.87 for 1000 It's been pretty stable. Um, and so then you have an option. You can either be doing stuff in a world that earns you Linden dollars and then use those to pay your, your leaseholder or your, your landlord. Or you can go to a third party site like Gaming Open Market and just buy them. And much like us granting IP rights to our users, our terms of service specifically say that that's all OK. You can go buy and sell. You can try to make money, et cetera, et cetera. So I have 3,000 unique creators a day. Right? That's more than contribute to Debian by a lot, more than contribute to Firefox. Right? What's interesting when you talk to the residents about this is their, their thought process aligns very closely with people who contribute to open source. People who may have a little bit of time, kind of want to make the world a better place. And what's interesting is we get to gobble up all the ones who don't know how to write code. And there are a lot of them out there. So we talked already, go double tap. We talked already about you know, the standard place for, for online games is to not allow any of this. Um, and of course, we talked about the fact that we do let them own their intellectual property rights. So for example, Pixel Dolls, one of our more successful online clothing retailers, right? they could register that as a trademark. Right? They could decide to go sell stuff in the real world. We have a, a clothing designer who has a website it's completely full of her Second Life clothing designs, who got invited to a fashion week in Italy based on her website, <laughs> only to have her explain to them, you do realize I don't actually make clothes, <laughs> which was a very surreal connection. Um, and we'll talk about where licensing may come in. One other thing that's important to think about, uh, one of the pushbacks we've gotten in the past is that, well, why don't you make this sort of commons land, right? So no IP, everything is owned by everybody, da 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 da. And it's certainly an interesting discussion to have, right? The, the way to increase innovation, provably, is to reduce the cost of learning, right? And intellectual property acts as an increased cost on learning. The downside is, right now, Second Life is a consumer of content from the real world, right? We have a lot of content that flows in from the real world. And without some kind of IP regime, there's a lot of content that couldn't flow into Second Life. Conversely, without an IP regime, it's hard to know how it would flow back into the real world. And this commerce and this, mat this interaction between the real and the virtual is a, is a very critical component of Second Life. Now, if you go to talks by some other developers in this space, they'll talk about the magic circle or the membrane, right, where there's the real world and then there's the game and the game is protected. One of the things that Second Life does that is somewhat controversial is we really try to demolish that membrane in a lot of ways. We say, look, information can flow through the magic circle and then in fact that that's good. And we get a lot of people doing things like well, gosh, Second Life, it was sometimes hard to find stuff. In fact, we'll talk about search as one of our big problems going forward. So what they do? They built you know, websites to buy and sell stuff. And they use the scripting language to pass data back and forth, XML RPC, da 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 right? And so now there are these nice web-based ways to buy and sell stuff inside our virtual world, right? They gave me open market has ATMs inside the virtual world where you can go and you can make deposits into your account and buy and sell stuff. Again, all built using the scripting language, just built within the system. And then Snapzilla, where, where some users just deciding to say, well, Flickr is cool, so we'll do a Second Life Flickr. And so that allows you to take snapshots in World and annotate them and just kick them out. And so I didn't have time to grab a snap screenshot of this morning. We have users who have a um, folksonomy based landmarking tool for spaces in Second Life, for places. 
that's starting to gain some traction. And so it's been very interesting watching how our users explore and take what they know from the web and try to apply it to Second Life. Yeah? Do you have uh, like viruses and stuff like that? Like, what's stop an avatar from beating up my avatar and taking my money? Um, so generally speaking, that which is in your inventory or your backpack is not available to other people, period. There is, there is no game mechanic, which is if I hit you, you, you drop gold, right? So conventional more pigs, if you die, your stuff falls on the ground. It's sort of one of the, the death penalties within those games. We don't have anything like that. Um, now, we are a fully scriptable, scriptable, physically modeled world. We have more ways to grief than any game in history, right? And in fact, when, it's a, for those who don't know, griefing is a common term in online games. It's the experiencing pleasure by reducing the pleasure of others. I, and so in Second Life, like a really common griefing behavior for a while was the push gun, right? It's very easy to make a weapon that applies physical forces to the other person's avatar. And so I knock you up into the stratosphere or I knock you into a building. So one of the big discussions we had, option A, take away the ability to apply physical forces to another avatar. Well, so we could do that. That would have stopped that form of griefing. But there are a lot of really positive and fun things you can do by applying forces to another avatar. One of them was we had some users who were annoyed that we don't have multi-avatar animations. So we have animations and you can just upload BVH files so you can make your own animations, but they wanted hugging. So what they did is they built a, an object that you wear that, a, that basically transmits an animation and applies forces to another avatar to line that avatar up with you and then you hug each other, right? So there's a very positive use of all of the same scripting calls that before were being used to grief. So instead what we said is we're going to attack these by social norms. So it's against the community standards except in dangerous areas. The world's divided into uh, safe and dangerous. In dangerous, it's legal to knock people around with push guns, you know, drop 10,000 tons of weights from the stratosphere and try to hit people. All of those things go on in the dangerous places. Um, some of them I mean, are often on fire and, you know, and in fact, the closest thing to a virus we have seen is people figured out how to do self-replicating fire, which you can imagine how good that is for the system. Um, and every now and then, someone will screw up scripting-wise, and it'll spread, and we'll have to go track it down. And it's sort of the gray goo problem, right? Only since you're only in, in bits, it's sort of easier to create gray goo. But our position has been that we'll punish the people who do that. We'll make a system that can recover from those events. And frankly, sometimes they become sort of part of the lore. Right. Oh, do you remember when Americana, Americana was a community for a while? Remember when all of Americana was on fire, right? And you know, it just, it, it's sort of part of the users who were there at that point. And so much like, so much like we have safe and, 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 and unsafe, we also have PG and mature, right? And so one of the really common behaviors for a long time was going into the PG areas and taking your clothes off. Explain the, the, the aspects of human behavior that cause this or left as a you know, challenge to the reader. But what's interesting is it only took about a month and a half of punishing people for doing that to have that behavior just stop. And we will occasionally see it. But the social pressures of, try, of doing that are such that if you do that, people will tell you, hey, you can't do that, which is way more effective than any technical solution. And so. And much like IP, right, is there infringement? Well, the only way to know infringement really is to have people look at it. So use things like DMCA takedowns so that you can come in after the fact and determine if a behavior was in fact infringing. Yeah? I, I would have some real concerns about the scalability of those kinds of social constraints. I mean, that's, that's a lot of what you get out of lessons from Lucas Film Habitat, mm -hmm. too, is that as it scales, the social constraints become less and less effective. Have you thought about what you want to do downstream? Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the, yeah, one of the advantages of only being able to have so many avatars in one place at one time is that we're already starting to see communities forming and basically um, moving away from the mainstream, for lack of a better term. And also, one of the things that we give all landowners are enormous controls over who can come onto their land. Right? And so you can build a big area and say, I'm only going to let in my friends, or maybe I trust your friends too. And so we're giving them tools to scale aspects of community that are important. And we're constantly watching what they're doing from an overall community growth standpoint 
and talking to them and doing surveys and everything else. So I agree that that is a big concern. But it's a, be a little bit like saying, well, could the, could the web grow give, given that you, know, you have people who are going to do bad things on websites? Well, you do, but you still have growth and you still have communities that form within it. Do I think that all of Second Life is going to be one homogenous community? God, I hope not. I think that would be a lot less interesting than lots of interesting communities that interact at, the, at their edges. And there was a hand that went up. Um, so you talked a little bit about administration. So you purchase one of these plots of land. How powerful are you? Are you essentially God? Can you boot people out of your area or uh -huh. do all sorts of things? Like you said, drop a 10,000 pound weight on somebody in a danger zone? How well, you could do that. But if, you've, if your land is marked safe, that would be a community standards violation actually for you to do that. Right? There's a presumption when you make the decision to buy safe land that you're going to play by the rules of the land being safe. And if you don't, potentially we ban you for days or hours or kick you out of the system. And if we kick you out of the system, your land goes up for auction. People come in and happily buy it, and we move on. And speaking of, where is the mouse? Where's the mouse? Speaking of landowners, so this is Anche Chung. So Anche came into Second Life. She likes to joke that the, the, only, the only money she paid us out of pocket was the $10 sign-up fee. So the, the simulators are $1,000 up front. They actually just went up. So $1,200 up front and $200 a month. And I think at last count, she owns 70. And she's cash flow positive by a lot. So she's our first land baron. And um, she has been enormously successful at, well, both detecting arbitrage opportunities and um, and more importantly, building the kind of communities that you were asking about. So one of the things that she's doing right now is she's aggressively building German and French-speaking communities within Second Life because we have a lot of international customers that we don't particularly market to or address their needs. And so she's building communities around people who don't speak English as a first language and is having a lot of success having people come in and buy that land. And so what's neat about it is she's able to do this with very little capital for a variety of reasons. One, she's able to earn money in world. She's able to leverage the relatively inexpensive creative power of the other users. And like we were talking about, you don't have marginal cost of reproduction. You don't have all of the problems that atoms bring with you, right? You know, in the real world, you have economies of scale. So you get traffic in Walmart. And we don't have to have those things. Now, there are very interesting arguments about what pieces of those we should bring in, right? And when you talk about intellectual property, you're effectively talking about artificially creating some of those. But the idea is to keep them as low as possible. So we're talking about leveling in the conventional more pigs, right? So D&D had levels, so Mud 1 had levels, so more pigs have levels. Second Life doesn't have levels. There's nothing from day one that you can't do when you come in. There is no, you must kill 14 spiders, and then you get the punch move or whatever. We just, we just don't have any of that. Um, and in fact, a common joking question among our users is, of course, whether this is a game or not. But this doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of play and gameplay within Second Life. Everything from dogfighting, those are airplanes built in Second Life, flying in the scripting system, flying you know, in the rigid biodynamics, shooting each other. And you might not be able to see it, but the lower one's being flown by a chicken, because you know, that's the kind of bizarre interactions we get in Second Life. <laughs> um, the lower right-hand one is actually an advertisement. So remember the Saburo Compact Exploder that I showed? This is an ad from inside Second Life that he commissioned from other users. And how he did that is he actually held a contest to say, can you make the best ad for my gun <laughs> in world? And then paid them currency, Linden, you know, Linden dollars, for the best ads and then ended up using those ads. And we've been seeing a lot of game creation. Uh, we actually just finished a, a game design competition that we had, I think, 32, no, 64 teams originally applied. We accepted 32. We ended up with um, five very playable good games at the end of it, which is actually very similar to the kind of odds you'd see in conventional game development. The upper left, or upper, yeah, your left one was kind of cool. It was the idea of this board game taking over a town. And what was cool is they went in and they redid all the art to be this very playful, sort of cell shaded style artwork within this space. And it was very playable, very fun. Um, the lower right hand one, there's this subculture within Second Life of people who build large games but don't want to own land. So we have these public build areas where you, we basically wipe them every 12 hours, but you're free to just build to your heart's content. And there's this whole subculture that's evolved around building in those spaces. And what a lot of them play is um, 
And there's a, a, a miniature game called Warhammer 40,000 that, in fact, there's going to be an online game based on that eventually. Well, they decided that they needed to make bear hammer, so they made all of these pieces out of these, these teddy bears, and they basically used Warhammer rules for the, for the convention, and they play what is effectively a tabletop miniature game in an online space collaboratively with a bunch of people just in these public build spaces because they want lots of space. Um, one of the other things that we see in those spaces is competition to build the biggest, scarier, scariest spaceship. And so you'll wander in, suddenly there will be this tremendously large spaceship with people debating whether it's cooler than yesterday's spaceship and things like that. Again, when creation's really easy, people will explore the design space very aggressively. So, you know, broadly where we are today, like we're saying, we see a lot of amateur amateur. This is one of the things you have in Second Life is a finder. So what events are coming up? And a lot of the events are basic building, introduction to scripting. And again, these are all users teaching each other. The same users then build websites of how to do better texturing, how to use the scripting language, et cetera, et cetera. One of the first examples, and still a very good one, of really closing the loop in Second Life was Abbott's Aerodrome. And th these were some users who figured out that skydiving in a virtual world is actually really fun. And yeah, it, it, the snicker, snicker, laugh, laugh. But it is. It's actually kind of cool. And what they determined was that people wouldn't necessarily get it right away. So they started holding classes. They started giving away their cheap parachutes. And they closed the loop and built this whole community around skydiving, taking screenshots of your best jump, taking, going jumping with your friends. And so what they sell are their good parachutes, and they also sell like jump planes. So you want to go skydive with 16 of your friends, you can all fly up together. And because it's a virtual world, you all jump out of the plane. Nobody has to be, still be a pilot. The, you know, the, the plane derezzes, goes back in your pocket, and then you're skydiving down with your friend. Um, and they've been, and what's interesting about it, the upper left hand is, is their whole aerodrome, which is this whole area sort of built around flying machines. And they've really tried to establish themselves as the flying machine company. And it's funny because every, I used to always use this one spot in it for demos. And then one day, of course, they completely revamped it all. And, you know, I got there, didn't know where to go for the demo anymore, which is when we talk about search, the fact that building's easy means that a lot of things can be very ephemeral. Right? Someone can just decide, I want to rebuild my apartment complex you know, tonight, which makes search an even trickier problem because things that you expected to be there may have moved or have gone away. We also see a lot of altruistic behavior. Um, these were a group of users who started raising money in Second Life. Um, this was a, they raised like $1,600 for EFF, and they did that in a month. And this was at a time when our user base was only a couple thousand people. Um, and, and sort of all of these standard things. We've seen American Cancer Society, hurricane relief last year. And in fact, there's an employee of the American Cancer Society who took one of their campaigns and did a second life piece of the campaign, raising virtual currency, which you then convert to US dollars and give. And then it turns out that when you try to give it, the, the charity says, so where did this money come from? How do we account for that exactly? And they get very scared and confused. It takes a while. <laughs> Um, so those are more examples of, of uh, Francis's um, advertising campaign. And again, he got a lot of very impressive artwork out of that. Uh, so Tringo. Tringo, our favorite example so far of why licensing is important, or why IP rights are important. So this was a user named Kermit Quick, who over his Christmas break in Australia decided that he wanted to make a game in Second Life. So he created Tringo, this sort of you know, stepchild of Tetris and Bingo. And one of the things he did is he thought really hard about what works well in Second Life. And what works well are the community aspects, being able to move money around, chatting. And you don't want to do something where you need to have really, really interactive frame rates and things like that. Because a lot of times, a lot of users, our frame rates are relatively low. So he made this game where you sit and play this, this game. And it's just swept Second Life. And he made about the equivalent of like five or 6,000 US selling the game and, and licensing it inside Second Life or franchising it inside Second Life. Well, then what he did is a real-world cell phone company approached him, a mobile game company approached him about licensing Tringo, and he got paid a, a, an announced low six figures to license Tringo into the real world to be on cell phones. We haven't seen it yet, um, although I've, I've played the Flash, initial Flash version of it, and it plays pretty much the same way. And, um, and he can only do that because he actually owns that. We, we weren't involved in that transaction in any way, shape, or form, purely between him and the, the company. 
And we see more things like that. And when you start talking about what your users can do, what your residents can do, it becomes very powerful. We had um, James Cook, who actually did the work, was a student at, or at, sorry, was a researcher at UC Davis. And he built a virtual hallucination, virtual hallucination simulation. And what this was is this was a simulation of schizophrenia. <laughs> And what they did is they went and actually talked to patients and got real hallucinations. And they built a simulation of it. And then what they op did is they opened it up in Second Life and let people go through it. They let family members go through it. They let doctors go through it. And then they surveyed all of them. And what's interesting about this is, one, it turned out to be, get very some, somewhat interesting results from the surveys. But the more important thing from a research standpoint is he got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of survey results for a month of work and a few hundred dollars of expense. Which if he had had to do that in the real world, A, he couldn't have done it, and B, it would have cost him a lot more. And this is where, and, and again, the sec, Linden Lab, the company that makes Second Life, we didn't have to do anything with this. This was just a user saying, I'm buying land and I'm going to go do this. In a very similar way, a caregiver um, with, some, with nine very physically disabled patients started bringing them into Second Life together. And she'd drive, and they'd tell her where to go. And they'd answer, respond to chat, and everything else. And it became known as the sort of the nine souls of Wild Cunningham, because Wild Cunningham was the in-world version. And they now have a blog where they talk about their experiences in the world. And it's just heart-wrenching to read about. But again, here's somebody who's just a resident of Second Life realizing that this was a tool that they could just use. And it's there, and it doesn't cost them any more to do this. So in the same way, John Lester. Um, who runs Brain Talk Communities, which focuses on um, a lot of neurological conditions, including Asperger's, had the idea of what happens if you brought kids with Asperger's into Second Life? What happens if you allowed kids who have never been in a face-to-face -face communication that they've had control of, what happens when you give them that control? And they built the space to do that. And you can see the position of the seating to have, to have, to have conversations. And they were very careful about setting up all of the seats, the right distances apart to be very natural. And when you talk to these kids coming back into the real world, it's dramatic. Now, this is all anecdotal, but John Lester also is on staff at Mass General and at Harvard University. And they're very interested in what else we can learn from this. Because again, this is something where you just have a user going and doing this. Now, John Lester got together with the caregiver from the cerebral palsy patients, and they built Live to Give Island in Second Life which was this, a place in Second Life to help educate others about living with various neurological conditions. So now you have extremely disabled people who feel so empowered by this that they immediately want to give back. They want to get out there and actually teach other people. And it's, it's amazing to go to it. And they have pictures of themselves up in it. And you can, you know, they have a lot of links there to other research material. And it's really pretty cool. And we are also seeing a lot of pure research, right? We get a lot of sociology research. Um, we're starting to see business experimentation. You know, so you want to just determine whether Creative Commons could be useful for selling a product. Well, open two stores in Second Life selling the same thing. It's a lot cheaper than doing that with brick and mortar. And you're inside an economy that you have excellent tools to measure the results with. Um, and then obviously collaboration, right? Here you have this whole world that's built collaboratively. And until you've actually been in the world building something alongside other people, it, it's hard to realize just how cool it is because it is very similar to doing things in the real world because you have this immediate feedback of being with other people while you do it. Um, and then we have a lot of universities in Second Life. So these are university classes, just teaching classes in Second Life. We tend to see five or six classes a semester using Second Life. So where do we go from here? Um, so this was great. So this was a user who also happens to be an AI researcher in the real world, who is playing around with sort of the usual Boyds and genetic algorithms. But she published the standards for communication of her fish. And so people start coming here and saying, well, put my fish in. So suddenly you have a distributed AI experiment as different people modify the script and the behaviors and start introducing their fish into this pool from all over the world. And of course, the really scary thing was uh, one of our employees was actually doing a demo. And as a joke, he's like, and wouldn't it be funny? So he pulls out his gun and starts shooting. 
And since the gun actually conformed to one of the standard, there's, there's several competing standards in Second Life for guns interacting with things. Well, the fish, had dis they, the person who wrote the fish had decided to, 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 to obey one of the gun rules. And so all these fish started dying around him. And he felt really bad. <laughs> and you know, the person he's there with is like, oh, well, don't tell anybody that we, that we murdered all these fish, you know, which is surreal on so many levels. So th this is the, the ultimate in the membrane going full circle. There are life drawing classes in Second Life where models pose, people sit in the real world drawing, and then scan and upload their drawings and then critique each other. Yeah, no, it's the amount of full circle creation that you see is very interesting, much like this, right? Mystery Science Theater 3000. So we stream video into Second Life. We actually don't stream it into Second Life. We let you hurl and hurl, and then we stream, you know. So anything on the web, you can stream to your client. It's just like you were running, um, you know, uh, whether you're running a video or audio stream outside of us. And there's a lot of publicly available movies, particularly like 50s, how to be a good student or, you know, how to not lie to your parents kind of videos. And so people sit around and do the Mystery Science Theater thing where you're sitting around with 10 other people slamming on this movie, cracking jokes, and it's hilarious. <laughs> so Cory Doctorow is a sci-fi author um, who tends to release his books, Creative Commons. And so for his most recent novel, he released the, the novel into Second Life early and said, let's have a competition to see who can make the best readers for reading my book inside Second Life. And then what he did is he held a book signing of all of the readers. And how he did that was, again, he signed a piece of paper in the real world, took a picture of it, uploaded the picture, and then people added the now signed version into their readers. They now had virtually signed copies of Cory Doctorow's book inside a virtual world. And just to give you an idea of the sort of creative collisions you get in Second Life, right, this was the book signing, and that's the line, right? So these are people waiting to come up in and sign them, and that's one of the examples of the book that somebody had made, and Corey's sitting back there. And sure, you get a lot of dissonance with this, but a lot of dissonance can also be very interesting. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that we're pretty excited about coming up, coming up next. Um, so... My, the developer did it, thought it was funny to take a black and white picture, but so this is the latest version of Abbott's Aerodrome where all the scripts are actually running on Mono, so the open source.NET framework. So rather than using our own script execution engine, we're using Mono. We compile the LSL scripting language to CLR. It's all good. So we are very, very excited about that. Um, we can talk at length about problems doing that. But anyway, um, we're just about done embedding Firefox um, for bringing all sorts of HTML content in, which our users are already kind of drooling about. We're upgrading to Havoc 2, which means better rigid body dynamics. And of course, a new graphics engine, because everything you've seen is a graphics engine that's four and a half years old on its best days. Um, and so obviously what gets interesting here is we stay in bits. We don't move into atoms. We give all this collaboration. So what happens when you start giving people all this creativity? So there are, however, some things that need to get done better. Uh, and the first one's obviously search. We have all of the problems of search on the web without a lot of the advantages the web gets. The web gets to pick up extra semantic information because of, of hyperlinking. And we don't get that. So which means it's something like folksonomies. It's something like broadcast. Um, you get things like, how do you do affinity matching? Do you do Docomo style, for example? So the, the Japanese cell phone company, you can do things like, I am looking for this. If you're nearby somebody who matches that, it'll beep and say, by the way, you're within 10 meters of somebody who matches this. Do you want to talk to them? Right, so we could do that kind of approach. Um, very interesting questions about how do you embed reputation in this and how do you make all, of course, this scale and run fast. Oh, and connect to the real world so that you can be doing all of these searches on the web as well as in world. And of course, you need to find people because you want to, a lot of people want to build businesses. And this is where we get into some really interesting questions. And unfortunately, she left. But talking about scaling communities, one of the big problems that online communities get is that the linchpin leaves. Right? You have only to look at SourceForge and look at the percentage of completed projects versus the, the set of you know, started projects and start correlating these, these initiated projects with lack of interest of the founder to see what happens when key people leave these kinds of projects. Now, will adding money in incent them not to leave? Probably. But what other things can you do when you talk about project management to survive the loss of the founder? Or can you? Right? What other tools can you leverage both on the web and in a 3D space that allow you to better be able to 
collaborate on something that is effectively on the scale of small games, where we have 20 person teams working for six months on projects. Right? So these are relatively large you know, investments of time and energy to create things. What tools do we give them to make them more efficient at doing that and more effective at doing that? And then how do we let them manage money? Because that's what, all, what they really want a lot of times. And then you start getting into, well, should groups, right? Should a group of people have a checking account? Does that start looking like a corporation? Oh my God, do we have to bring Delaware into Second Life? You know, I'd really rather not. And so there's some, some really tricky questions there. And of course, what, when you are creating, the big issue is how do you increase player-to-player -player communication bandwidth? Everybody says, well, you should just have chat, as in you know, voice chat. There are many issues on both sides of the voice chat debate. The biggest one and most obvious one being that many people play avatars that are massively unlike their real world appearance. And when you add voice in, it is very weird, to put it mildly. Plus, a lot of people really like online because of the fact that it allows them to actually look at what they're chatting, right? You start typing. You go, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I didn't mean to call him that. Delete, 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 delete. You know? And you can do all the things that, that you're all used to from IM. Plus, you get a history of it, right? So you can go back and say, hey, what did I miss? But the downsides, as I'm sure all of you guys know from having IM embedded into your normal workflow, right? When you're sitting and working on something and you hear your name, it's very easy to pop out of what you're doing and react to that. It's much harder to respond to a ding or some other effect coming out of your IM client. It's hard to just keep, you know, it's hard to be scanning 12 simultaneous IM conversations effectively in a way that you could do if you were listening to them. So if there were good cross-platform synthesis and recognition, I know how I would solve that problem or at least attack the problem. And we've done some experiments. It's really cool. Right, so you, you chat, you do recognition, you send the text, and then you synthesize the text on the other end. What's neat about it is it lets you do any voice you want on the other end. The fact that you're typing tends to disguise, I'll get you in a sec, tends to disguise a little bit better than actual speaking with masking, whether the person is male or female. Um, and you still get the history of it. Plus you get all the humorous aspects of doing recognition on voice, which I just find funny, but yeah. Not have voice uh, chat right now. No, a lot of our users use TeamSpeak and other third-party apps, and the <clears throat> the scripting language is powerful enough <laughs> that they've figured out ways to localize TeamSpeak without actually embedding in our product, which is frankly where so they'll do they'll do attenuation based on distance by communicating out of the app where the people are relative to each other, um, which is pretty cool, but we don't have that embedded yet. Now. Again, it's not in my mind because it's necessarily that hard, and there are plenty of third-party apps to it. Hell, Skype practically begs any, any online app, please embed us. Um, but again, without good masking, and even with good masking, voice might not be the right answer. And unfortunately, because either it's hard or because there's no good business case for it, there isn't a lot of, a lot of progress in that area. Um, and like on masking, right, Xbox Live being the great example of masking, right? The, the Nellie Moser masking technology is okay. And it's been close to being good for about four years. And it seems to be about a year away from being really good. And it's been a year away for that same four years. And so I don't see that getting over the hump anytime soon. Now, if it does, that'd be great. I think you'd see a bunch of games immediately jump on good masking technology. But again, it has to be really good and it needs to hide the fact, well, it needs to hide something that it doesn't do well, which is a man speaking, even if you convert it into a female voice, is usually pretty obviously male. Um, and of course, so after you have the business, you then get into the really tricky one. And this gets back into everything related to IP, which is who built it. Now, we mark everything in world with the creator. But guess what? It goes to a hostile machine, which is the user. And as I'm sure everyone here agrees with me, right? Anything that gets on the hostile computer can be copied. More importantly, anything that gets on a hostile computer will be copied. And so then you start getting into what do we do beyond trying to getting into this sort of maybe futile, well, well undoubtedly futile, but maybe wasteful arms race of trying to keep the honest people honest while the dishonest people still go ahead and copy stuff. Is there a way after the fact to go in and detect that something's a copy? Or at least is the same as something else in the world? Um, there's some interesting work that's been done. So all of our textures, for example, are compressed using J2C, JPEG 2000 standard. 
Um, and there are some watermarks that will survive JPEG 2000 compression and decompression. The downside is you've got users who are going to be actively trying to defeat whatever your watermarking technology is. And they go, oh, gosh, we've discovered we can make this much of a change, and then the watermark is invalid, blah, 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 blah. So are there other approaches that can be done there? What's interesting about this is this applies way outside the game space. Right. If you can come up with better techniques for marking digital data that survive that data being munged with, that would be cool. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to just have to rely on social pressures and people. Right? If, you, if, you, if you're running a successful store and you see your product somewhere else, you would do just like you did in the real world. Because we're, we're not going to be able to, we're not going to restrict things so much that we can't stop that. And if you look long term, we're probably going in a direction that people are going to have more access to our code and more ability to run stuff, which means more of our system is running on hostile machines, which means more ability to copy stuff. And then, of course, we get into the really geeky stuff. Um, so we do a lot of communication between processes running on different machines. Gosh, it would be nice if. Type safety would be cool, especially without the overhead of, well, XML, um, hence the high performance requirement. Um, we use XML RPC and other XML formats in a few places, um, but it's been interesting to see progress or lack thereof in this space. Um, that there, clearly, we're at an uncomfortable part of the curve where we're doing lots of arbitrary messaging. Hence, you want type safety, but we need high performance, which web apps tend not to need. So, somebody eventually is going to tackle this, and we're going to greedily jump on whatever they do. In the meantime, we're probably just going to keep leveraging progress in XML, but. Um, this would be nice for somebody to be thinking about. And then, of course, the one from, that I just spotted this morning, which is the really, really geeky one. So John Carmack, who made Doom, Quake, Wolf 3D, right, guru of all things PC and graphics, um, gives a, a keynote at QuakeCon, which is their big convention for their games. And what was really cool about his talk this year is he talked about, he, he sort of led off with, you know, GPU technology is finally where I want it to be, more or less. And I just have these two minor things I want done. I want textures to be virtualized, and I want to be able to handle not having to batch geometry. What's really cool about that from my perspective is my weight with ATI and NVIDIA can be measured in you know, micrograms. His weight, very big. And those are the two things that we've been begging for for four years. Because it's two things that up till now haven't been needed for first person shooters. If you're not familiar with the sort of state of the art graphics pipeline, it is thus. You take a very complex scene, you pre-process the hell out of it, and you turn it into these exact, very carefully measured out batches. And then you very carefully hand those batches to the 3D card where it merrily draws those really quickly. And you do that so fast that you can then have like 30 or 40 dynamic things that are changing. Typical scene in Second Life, on the other hand, is made up of, oh, say, 80,000 small polygon objects, of which many of them will be moving. Um, and physically active and changing, et cetera, et cetera. And like 3,000 textures, because we let users texture anything in the scene. Again, if you looked at a first person shooter model, they will give the artist, here is your texture budget. You will just tile out of this texture. And so what he's looking for is something that actually would improve their art pipeline, which takes us back to the first part of the talk. Right? Content creation costs are killing us. When you look at the delays on Doom 3, which was the longest, most expensive game it has made, it was all content creation costs. It was making the levels. And one of the things that made it hard was having to force the artist to be constrained by to these very tight texture requirements and not allowing them to do small changes in the geometry because it would break all of your pipelining. So what's really cool about this is that we now have an 800-pound gorilla trying to do something that I want. So that's great. The other good thing is Microsoft has actually been talking about this as well. Not so much the texture, but about the removing of some of the batch problems. And a big part of DX10 that's been talked about publicly is very much trying to address these issues. And so I applaud anybody who's, who knows anything about DX for, for working on that, because that's great. Though, of course, we're an OpenGL app. But still, um, the reason this is good is that for DX10 to really make progress in this space, ATI and NVIDIA are going to have to make changes to their architecture as well. So this is fantastic, and I'm very glad that it's happening. Um, so if you want to learn more about this, obviously, Second Life itself. Secondlife.com, it's downloadable. You can be in it in seconds. Um, Terra Nova is an academic blog that talks about a lot of these issues. New World Notes is our embedded journalist um, who talks about all things Second Life in, in great detail. And then Brigadoon and Live to Give have their own blogs where you can actually interact with the people who are in there um, doing these things. 
and that's it for me. So, you guys have any? Yes. Do you have any uh, interesting <laughs> security problems with letting thousands of people write and run programs on your service? Yes. Yes, yeah, so we wrote our own scripting language and wrapped it in crypto. No, um, basically, in fact, this is one of the problems with Mono right now. Um, code access security isn't done in Mono yet, and not even close to done. So instead, what you do is you filter the opcodes. Um, similarly, for our scripts, um, well, what do you do? You avoid the obvious. You try not to give people buffer overflows. You, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The good thing is, is I have thousands and thousands and thousands of people writing scripts every day trying to attack the system. So the good thing is we have a very, very, you know, effective attack in the sense, effective in the sense of they're exploring the design space. Um, as we move to Mono, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to filter out opcodes like, you know, .NET Framework. They could issue a, you know, exit, which would be bad. So uh, we're going to have to filter those initially. Um, in the long run, it would be better if they actually get CAS done, um, and then we may end up relying on that. Um, though we may just keep filtering opcodes because we have an opportunity to do that. And in fact, we have to filter opcodes because um, we have, on a given simulator, say, a 1,000 scripts running simultaneously. And I'll get to both of you guys. Um, and a lot of those scripts are running interactively with player input. And so one of the things that Mono is not set up to do well is do lightweight threading. Um, hardware threads are way too expensive to do for you know, 2,000 scripts. Um, and the second thing we need to do is, so you have, say, a bullet. And the bullet has a sensor that's running, and it's happily flying along, and it gets to the edge of a simulator. Well, we now have to turn that into a packet, move it to another machine, and let it go run again, which means we have to encapsulate all state, all memory, da 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 which, again, Mono isn't really set up to support that very well. So what we've done is we've gone and we add opcodes that basically break out regularly and say, hey, do I need to be moved? Do I need to give up, give up execution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that was a lot of the work that we had to do. And then you were next. Do you log everything that happens in Sigma? Everything is a really big word. I mean, um, can you start at day one and play it at fast? No, absolutely not. Um, we throw away data as fast as we can. Like I said, I've got eight terabytes of user data at this point, and that's just what they need now. Our log generation is ridiculous. Um, so we try to log everything that we can. Um, there are other reasons why we want to throw the data away as fast as we can. We don't want to be subpoenaed. It's much easier if the data is not there. Um, though current FCC m movement in that area may change that. If they apply CALEA to games, which they may, um, CALEA is the uh, access to law enforcement for originally telephones, but now it's being applied to voice over IP as well. And the FCC has issued it as IP-enabled services, whatever the hell that means. And so there are some thoughts that they may end up trying to apply that to communication in games as well. And then you suddenly get into, you need to maintain two years of backups and da 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 da, da. But we'll cross that bridge when we came to it. And you were first. Yeah, how do you convert yourself to other sites like there.com, both in your, your direction, your vision, where you're going? So um, there.com often gets mentioned in the same sentence. That we, they started a couple years before us. They shipped about a year after us. Um, and we actually hired Jeff Ventrella about a week ago, who uh, was one of the founders. Um, so there.com got started as a chat application where they wanted to embed the chat in 3D, um, which, is, which is cool. Um, they really didn't, however, start from the base of we're going to allow creation of everything. Where Second Life started out as a, as a cellular automaton networking tech demo. <laughs> right? We started out, can we network machines together and do continuous and discrete simulation across those boundaries? Once we knew we could do that, then we figured out we could do streaming. Once we did that, we figured out we could make everything change all the time. Once you have that, then you come to the conclusion of, oh, well, why don't we let the users build everything? Um, so, and there's kind of gone through rough times because they did the spend like it's 1999 and then crash like it's 2003. Um, but they're back, which is cool. Um, and they've been rapidly trying to pivot onto sort of the user creation as well, but it's not easy to do. The other big difference between us and them is that their approach is users make stuff and then submit it, and then you approve it, and then it can be in the world, which would be a little bit like having the web be approved by somebody. Um, and so it just doesn't scale. And when you talk about the freedom and power of user creation, the last thing you want to do is put a full stop in the process. Oh my god, I've got this thing I want to share with my, oh, well, it'll be approved tomorrow, maybe. Um, so philosophically, we're pretty different. Um, frankly, since there hasn't been a tremendous amount of success in this space, I'd rather see them be successful. Um, but, you know, we'll see. 
In terms of other online games, there really isn't anything out there much like us at this point. Um, I keep hearing about games that get started at other online game companies and then killed um, because it's hard to get, it's hard if you're a big company to get your mind around saying, oh, you're going to let your users own everything and you're going to let them make anything they want. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about, um, so we're 18 and over only, but there's now a parallel world called the Teen Grid, which is for people under 18, and they are not connected in any way. Well, they're, they're running on the same machines, but they're disconnected, I mean, they're, they're separated by access control. Um, eventually, we'll allow economic flow between them because then they're markets for each other, which would be really cool, but we haven't solved all the problems with that yet. I just had a following question to the um, comparison of other, you and other companies. Is it frustrating that you've been in the business for two years and then along comes World of Warcraft, and in a matter of months, they go from zero to you know, three and a half million people? For, for if, if, well, there are a couple things there. I mean, would I have enjoyed having their budget? That might have been fun. Um, so you can argue that there is a competition there just for time, right? Much like we compete with television. We've, we've been, you can see demographically a big, fairly significant shift of TV hours moving into online game hours and other game hours. Um, but no, I, I'm glad that they're successful. They've, so for about, let's say, four reasons. Um, they're making a lot of people buy really high-end computers, which is good. Um, they're exposing online games to a lot of people who might not have been exposed to online games before which is also good. Um, they don't have a, a compelling level 60 gameplay model, so I have people coming back. So that's good. Um, and I think they've shown um, that you can do big online games in Europe, which nobody really believed. And so that's a nice proof point. Um, and you know, them going into you know, China and Asia, I think, is, an, is it's unclear whether that's going to be good in the long run or not. Because you now have China saying, China announced they're going to spend one point some Thing, billion dollars on game development as a government? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, if, if, if the U.S. announced they were spending one point a billion dollars, would you bet on those games or not? I, you know, I don't know. But it's interesting, and I think it's going to have big impacts there. But they're they're training a lot of people that these games are interesting places to spend time, and I think that's good. Um, and frankly, I'd much rather have our growth curve than theirs, because their growth curve is this. And we continue to be completely referral-based and exponential. So I like that. What's the relation between law and the real world and lack of law if, or law? So like, suppose in Second Life, I wanted to trade something with someone, and we started the trade. They didn't give me what they were supposed to give me, and then they you know, proved to disappear. What, what happens? I mean, there a so that is a very interesting question, one that isn't clearly decided anywhere yet. Now, we have in our, in our terms of service that breaking real world laws is a violation of them and we'll boot you for it. And we're pretty aggressive about um, financial fraud. And you know, while identity is a little bit ephemeral in the online space, there are a lot of things you can do to be pretty sure you're banning them. Now, you may end up banning lots of people on their ISP as well, but you can, you, you can do things to, to knock them out. Um, but it's like any other anonymous transaction, right? However, if you look at, say, eBay, which has all of the same problems, it, they've managed to be relatively successful. Um, and what have they done? They've done things like dispute resolution. They're very aggressive about prosecuting fraud. They have a reputation system that's relatively effective, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, they still have stumbling blocks, and they still make mistakes, but they keep trying to learn from them. So you know, our goal in a lot of ways is to leverage what they've gone out and spent huge amounts of money trying to learn and then you know, copy it. So I've never had an opportunity to build anything. Could you just sort of run through the mechanics quickly just to give me the basics of how that works? So the easiest way would be customization. Most people who haven't built yet start by customizing, much like websites and everything else, right? So you'd buy a car that's, that, when, that the person selling it is telling you this is customizable or editable. And then it's literally like you could pull pieces of this podium off and change what material they're made out of, change what's on them, um, apply magic sauce, i.e. scripting code to it so you can make it float and hover or follow me around. Right? And all of it's interactive so that even if you make a mistake, A, you can see the mistake pretty quickly, and B, you can't really break anything. And I think that's one of the really important things is if you give people sandboxes to play in, they'll play in their sandboxes. And if you give people sandboxes that have lots of other people in them, 
you know, they'll learn from each other. Now, the downside of that is some people like to learn by themselves. And so you do need to give people the ability to go off and say, no, 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 I want to build a house around me, or I want to go in the basement and tinker, or go to my private island and tinker. And some people prefer to do that. But a lot of people just like going to our sandbox areas that will have 20 people in them building everything from, you know, bizarre physics experiments to, like I said, giant spaceships or the, the bear hammer game, and ask them. Right? And so we see a lot of that, too, that we see a lot of, you know, again, the amateur to amateur behavior. Um, if you've ever used, say, 3D Studio or Maya, the, the actual object creation tools look a lot like that, only they've been, where possible, made easier to use because those products are very complicated. Can I download those things onto my computer? And you, can't, later? you can't yet. Uh, one of the big things that's close is we're going to start supporting an export format. Um, because we're a solid body modeler, not to get too geeky, but we don't build, we build things out of objects rather than out of triangles. Um, most modeling packages build out of triangles, and so the conversion of one to the other is actually somewhat difficult, and we'll let some really smart grad student go solve that for us. Um, but in the meantime, we have a lot of users saying, please, can I export this to go to a website, or we have um, amateur game developers who say, look, I want to use this as a content creation tool so I can then pull content out and go use it in another game. So we're going to start supporting um, export, and right now it looks like we're going to jump on Kalia, which seems to be gaining some traction as an interchange format. How about all the other way around? Outside. That's where you get into the converting polygon creations into a solid body. It's, it's actually pretty tricky. Um, somebody will go solve that for us, because it's just an optimization problem. It's basically a 3D fitting problem. Um, once somebody solves that form, we are going to expose what our import path is, but writing the Maya to Second Life converter is going to be really, really hard. There's not room for the same tools as you have in game as a separate external, you know, personal sandbox that you can just play with. So we don't do that right now. And the reason we don't is more of a philosophical position than a technical one. That when possible we want to have people creating in world because that increases the chances to learn from other people, to interact with other people, et cetera, et cetera. All of the positive benefits that come from that. Now, what we're starting to see, so we had a, um, one of our users decided to write RSA encryption in the scripting language, which I wouldn't recommend trying to do. Um, and how he did it was he reverse and we published the, the, the um, we published what the language spec is. And so he wrote, a simulator of the language outside of Second Life so he could write and debug his code outside of Second Life so he'd actually have a debugger. Um, and so I think that as people need those things, we're very open about what our formats are. We are very open to those things. Long term, um, I'm sure many of those things will get written. Um, and in fact, when we talk, look at sort of where our client application goes going forward, it's to let it be more open to people writing plugins and ripping pieces out of it to go use in other places. Well, okay, so you're creating an online, basically, economy. What's to stop another company from coming along and basically copying your idea and devaluing all of these things that people have spent hundreds of hours creating? Well, obviously, if it was easy, I wouldn't be doing tech talks. Um, no, it's a really good question. Actually, the, the, the separate and equally really good question is what's to stop somebody just doing an economic attack? Like, you know, coming in, buying tons of currency up, and then dumping the currency. And there's some it's very separate, interesting discussion that goes there. Um, there are a host of very difficult decisions you have to make if you want user creation to work well. And many of them are letting go. And big companies don't like letting go. So it's very hard for, like, SOE keeps pitching a competitor, and they keep shooting it down. I know NCSoft has pitched one and shot it down. Um, it is difficult to give people, your residents, that much power. Especially if you're a big company who has defensible licenses, right? If you're Lucas, I mean, if you're Sony Online, you have Lucas breathing down your back. Are you going to jeopardize your Star Wars license because this, your, your side user creation game are all making, you know, lightsabers, right? Or, you know, giant, you know, at ATSTs or whatever was in the line at the Cory Doctorow thing, right? SOE might not be as interested in taking, taking that kind of risk. But it, so it comes down to, you know, would you be comfortable making the web and all of the good things that need to go into the web to make it work, or would you want to make something, you know, closed like, you know, traditional AOL model kind of thing? And a lot of companies are a lot more comfortable going that route, and actually there.com is very comfortable going that route, but that impedes the effectiveness of user creation, and I think in the long run is a really big mistake. 
Clearly, we should branch off. Yeah. You mentioned yeah, I think you're running on 1,200 machines. CPUs. Yeah. Are those just commodity hardware and, and new batch? Yeah, they're you scale. Do you just add? Machines? Yeah. So as we get as we get new customers, we just throw on more machines. They're currently uh, dual core, dual Optron 64s are currently the best uh, um, performance per watt. It's it's all a power game now. The actual CPU performance is irrelevant. It all comes down to how much power you can shove in the rack per per dollar. You just, as, as you add machines, the world expands. And right. That's it. Yeah. Well, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.